Yo, so guys, welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to some more Mr. Ballin, and the video is Top 3 Videos of Disturbing Backstories Part 5. I done a reaction to one of these a good 3-4 days ago, and some of the videos were crazy, and some of the stories were horrible, and it was a wild-ass video. But, yes, I had a few suggestions about people wanting me to do reactions to some more of this series, and... Yeah, I think the videos of disturbing backstories are definitely a bit more messed up than the pictures of disturbing backstories because when you get the context and then you see what's happened, again, the last one that I've done recently was mental. The last video was one of the wildest things I've seen on YouTube, to be honest, like people celebrating and being happy after doing something so horrible. And yeah, it was a pretty crazy reaction. I'll try and leave a link to it in somewhere if I remember. I'll probably forget, so... It was posted a few days ago and yeah, if you want to watch it, you can just find it on my channel. But we're going to jump into this and see some of these pictures or this, these videos, sorry. And yeah, hopefully going to enjoy. Links are in the description to some more of my reactions on my Patreon. Because I can't post lots of stuff onto YouTube for many reasons. Whether it's copyright or just them being strict with the certain content I react to. This is touching the surface of too much for YouTube, for my reactions posting on YouTube. Because they always get demonetized, which is fine. But sometimes they get age restricted and stuff. So yeah, other true crime stuff does go on my Patreon as well. Like BuzzFeed and Solve, which gets copyright struck. And just many other reactions. If you want to see them, links are in the description. And yeah, but let's jump into this and see see what, um, what this video is about. Today, I'm going to share with you three progressively more disturbing stories. And at the end of each of them, I'm going to share with you the video that is famously associated with them. But before I get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do and I upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button asks you for a particular link, send them a link to Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up and disguise it as whatever it is they're looking for. What the hell? Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss oh. any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Mine is for a second. Um, I don't know what it's doing on this screen. Is it gonna move? Oh, I could have just clicked it. Oh god, Asylum. Well, this is going to be a great reaction. God. Of course this is going to be horrible. I mean, it's involving an asylum. I assume it's just from the offset, it's going to be an abandoned asylum. I don't know, but that's just what I'm guessing. A popular YouTuber named Dan Bell explores abandoned buildings and then uploads that footage to his very popular This Is Dan Bell page that has over 500,000 subscribers. Unlike other urban exploration YouTube channels, Dan is not trying to create scary content. In fact, many of his most popular videos are taken in buildings that haven't even been abandoned yet, like in a Kmart that's shutting down and all the shelves are empty and he walks around and it's kind of eerie because it's this huge store that's now coming to an end but again it's not really scary but amongst those popular videos there is one that is horrifying and it's called the super creepy abandoned asylum one of the top comments on this video is from a verified youtube account with over a million subscribers they're called the proper people and they say this may be the creepiest urban exploration video i have ever seen the video opens with dan coming up to this huge old house that looks like nature is reclaiming it with all the vines and grass and everything overgrown all around it and for the first minute and a half dan is just quietly walking around the perimeter of this building and you don't really know what it is besides obviously the captions given away it's an asylum but it doesn't look like an asylum it looks like a random house in the middle of the woods after about a minute and a half oh dan makes my. his way over to the god this is some american horror story type building man this is right out of that show 100 side of this building and he sees there are some stone steps that go down into a door that clearly feeds into the basement of this building dan walks down the stairs he opens the door and he walks into this hallway and as soon as he goes in because his camera had been filming in very bright sunshine outside it takes a minute for it to focus on the hallway which is totally dark but once the camera focuses you see all this old clothing strewn about on the ground and the paint is peeling off the walls in every part of the building. 
When Dan filmed this, he was not out loud narrating as he walked around the building. Instead, while he was editing the footage, he must have recorded himself doing a narration, and that narration picks up as soon as he gets in the hallway and the camera has focused. He begins walking down this hallway, and you hear under his boots the crunch of broken glass. And as he's walking, you hear Dan's voice say, this is a children's asylum that shut down sometime in the 1990s. It was briefly leased sometime in the 2000s, but for the most part, over the past three decades, this building has been totally abandoned. After he gives this brief history, which sounds like he's done this dozens of times on other videos, he pauses and says, you know, something really strange happened while I was filming inside of this building. He heard what sounded like someone running around on the top floor of this building. He's used to going into abandoned buildings and finding creatures, animals running around. That was not unusual. And so instinctively, he assumes it's got to be some animal that's taken up residence on the top floor. And so he doesn't worry about it. He ends up walking around the whole first floor before making his way upstairs. Does he do this all on his own? For anyone who watches his channel, he might say, but does he do these explorations on his own? I mean, doing them is crazy. I've done it a few times. <clears throat> I remember in school, there was this abandoned book factory or whatever. And we were, I think it was a book factory anyway. And we all went there and we went to an abandoned, I think mental hospital as well. Asylum, I think it must have been as well. But it wasn't anywhere near similar to this. But yeah, this um, is a whole other level because I was with a group of people and it's still not safe. I'm not saying it's the best thing to do, but when you're a kid, you do stupid stuff and you explore. It's just interesting, you know. Um, but this on your own, like, mate, come on, man. And he said when he got up there, he was expecting to see some animal or some sign of an animal living up there. But he didn't. He didn't see anything. It just looked like every other abandoned building. And after filming what he wanted to film, he eventually leaves the building and goes home. It wasn't until he loaded the footage onto his computer and began reviewing it that he noticed two specific instances while he was inside this asylum where clearly someone else is in the room with him. Dan oh speculates my. that perhaps a former patient has come back here and is living in one of the rooms upstairs. Here are the two segments from his video that show that- Oh, I don't want to see it, bro. I don't want that nah, because it's going to cringe me out. I don't like seeing this sort of stuff. This kind of phantom person lurking in the shadows. In the first clip, keep your eyes on the door that is open leading downstairs. You'll see there is a shadow on the door that is being cast from whatever is standing at the top of the stairs just outside of our view. And at some point, as Dan is filming down the hall, that shadow vanishes down the stairs. In the second clip, when Dan walks into the room, look to the back left-hand side of the room at the door, specifically at the open hole where there should be a doorknob you will see there is very clearly someone looking through the hole at Dan. Oh no, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see this, man. Fuck. I'm going to have to The sound's probably going to be on. I'm going to tape one ear for now. And, and when Dan films this person, they run away. Oh my God. Oh my days. Second one, I'm not ready for this, man. Okay, oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought. It wasn't as bad as I thought. I thought it was gonna be like right up close to it. But still, that's mental. Oh my days. Okay, number two, killing time. Missy Beavers was a wife, a mother of three girls, and a hardcore fitness instructor. She lived in Midlothian, Texas, and she taught a fitness boot camp out of a local church at least one day a week, every week. Missy was extremely bubbly and outgoing, and everybody seemed to really like her, and her personality really shined on social media, where she was an avid Facebook user, often posting multiple times a day, every day of the week. Missy would post information about upcoming fitness classes, either that she was teaching or that she was simply participating in. She would also post her own fitness regimen and her diet. She was just very focused on health. She also shared fairly personal things like pictures of her family and where they were going and what they were up to. 
and she left her personal cell phone right on her Facebook page. So clearly Missy was fine with kind of being out there. On April 17th, 2016, there was a weather report that came in that the next day there was gonna be really, really heavy rain, in particular in the morning. And Missy's class was scheduled for the next morning at 5 a.m. and she started getting calls and texts. 5 a.m. in the morning, God damn, I respect it, but getting up that early every day for work is a whole other level, but you've got to rate it. Messages from the people who were going to that class asking, is this class still gonna happen? By 7.55 p.m. that night, so many people had asked about it that she decided to just put a public post on her Facebook page addressing the weather. And it just said, if it's raining, we're still training, no excuses, you are gladiators. On the post, she included directions of how to get to the church, where this class was gonna be in the church, what time they were starting, and what they could expect. Later that night at 9.23 p.m., she did another Facebook post that said, going to bed, I have to get up tomorrow at 3.30. The next day, at 4.16 in the morning, a street security camera picked up Missy pulling into the church's parking lot. Even though her class didn't start until 5 a.m., she liked to get there early to make sure the classroom was set up and to warm up a little bit and make sure she was super motivated and cheerful as soon as they walked in. The security cameras inside the church capture Missy walking in through the front doors at 4.20 in the morning. Then just before 5 a.m., the first couple of students arrived at the classroom and they walk in to find Missy laying on the ground, bleeding from her head, totally unresponsive. Uh -huh. They call 911, police and paramedics show up, and as soon as they get there, they pronounce Missy dead. Initially, there was some speculation that she might have fallen and hit her head, but they noticed all these puncture marks in her head that looked intentionally inflicted, like oh. someone had struck her. And later, when they reviewed the security footage from inside the church, it was confirmed that she definitely was murdered. Early oh, mate. God, see, this stuff's brutal. It's going to show... I don't know if it's going to show... It's not going to show her being murdered because that would be allowed on YouTube, but the person breaking it... Oh, man. Earlier that morning at 3.50 a.m., so 26 minutes before Missy arrives in the church parking lot, an unknown figure wearing police tactical gear from head to toe breaks into the church. What? From 3.50 in the morning when they first get inside the church to 4.20 in the morning when Missy walks through the front doors, this unknown figure just kind of strolls casually up and down the halls of this church. It looked like they were carrying a hammer or perhaps a crowbar, and periodically, as they're kind of casually walking down the hall, they would turn to a window of a door and they would break it with whatever they're holding in their hand, and then they would just keep walking on. Like, there was no reason for them to break the window, they're just bored. And this was actually an important point that police would make about this footage. This person walking around does not appear to want to vandalize the church. I mean, they're breaking a couple windows, but they could have done a lot more damage to the building, and they didn't. They don't appear to be looking to steal anything. And in fact, later, police would confirm that nothing was stolen. What it looks like they're doing is just kind of wasting time. Like, they have some clear objective for being here, but they can't do it quite yet. They're waiting for a trigger of some kind. And it would turn out that that trigger was Missy walking through those doors at 4.20 in the morning. As soon as Missy made her way into the classroom, the assailant followed her and proceeded to beat her to death with whatever they were holding in their hand. Man. By the time police arrived a little after 5 a.m., the suspect was long gone. Initially, police believed it was going to be fairly easy to identify who killed Missy. The person on camera wearing the tactical gear had a very distinctive gait with their feet turned out and they walked with a bit of a limp and they had very slouched posture. And the police figured as soon as we put this surveillance footage out in the public domain, some Someone's going to come forward and say they recognize this person. But despite the hundreds of leads that poured in from people after watching this video saying, oh yeah, I know this person. Well, the police checked into all of them and they all checked out. Everybody had an alibi. And so years later, the police are still not able to what? identify who killed Missy or why. And so her case remains unsolved. I hate unsolved cases so much. They're so annoying. Fuck, and now we're going to see the video. God damn. Oh. Here is the security footage of Missy's killer casually walking around the halls, aimlessly smashing windows and opening doors, just waiting for Missy to show up. What the hell? What? Why? What? I'm just struggling to understand what what the point in them doing this is for. Like, I don't get it. Are they actually in the police, or is it just like fake uniform? I mean, it must be fake uniform. They're not actually going to be the police. I assume not. But 
Granny Ripper. Huh? In March of 2015, 68-year-old Tamara Samsonova was having renovations done to her home in St. Petersburg, Russia. A friend of hers, 79-year-old Valentina Ulanova, had heard about Tamara's renovations, and she approached her and said, do you want to stay with me while that's getting done? Tamara was very thankful, immediately said yes, and as soon as she moved in, she immediately started picking up the slack by cleaning up the house and doing the dishes and made sure she always cooked food for her friend because she wasn't able to pay rent. After a couple of weeks, the renovations on Tamara's home were complete, but Tamara didn't want to leave. She was really enjoying living with Valentina, and so she asked Valentina would it be okay if she stayed a little bit longer. Valentina was a little bit reluctant, but did ultimately say, okay, that's fine. A couple of months go by, and Tamara is showing no sign that she plans on leaving Valentina's home anytime soon, what? and Valentina is getting increasingly frustrated with that reality. Finally, in late July 2015, Valentina confronts Tamara and says, you gotta go. And Tamara just says, no, I'm not leaving. This causes a What the hell? Wait, so they were friends, and then she just suddenly got too attached to either her or the house. Huge fight, but at the end of it, Tamara still doesn't leave. So for a couple of days, the women just do not speak to each other. The silence is finally broken on July 23rd when the women get into a fight about some empty cups in the sink that one of them was supposed to clean, but they didn't, and they fought about who's responsible. Okay, well, you do not have the right to do that. This is not your house. How are you arguing when it's not your place to- Oh my god, this is crazy already. Responsibility it was to do the dishes, and then of course the whole subject comes up again of Valentina saying, you shouldn't even be here, you need to leave, and Tamara's like, no, I'm not gonna leave, and so another big blowout fight happens but at the end of this fight Tamara finally concedes and says okay I get it I need to leave just give me a couple of days and I'll be out of your hair immediately the tension is gone in the room they're no longer fighting and Valentina is happy that she's finally gonna get her apartment back and Tamara says look I'll make us dinner tonight I'll go out and get some food Tamara leaves the apartment and goes to a pharmacy and gets a whole bunch of sleeping pills and then she gets the ingredients to a particular salad that she knows Valentina really likes. Oh my. She goes back, she starts making dinner, and as she's making the salad, she crushes up the sleeping pills and mixes the powder with the salad dressing and gives that to Valentina. And Valentina, who's very hungry, eats the whole salad and doesn't notice anything is wrong. Bro, what the hell? Oh, people are mental. People are actually mental. This was your friend. She offered you... What is going for pe- <laughs> As soon as Tamara was sure Valentina had eaten the entire salad, Tamara just goes up to her room and goes to bed. A couple hours later, at about two in the morning, she goes back down to the kitchen, and she sees Valentina is passed out on the ground. Tamara goes up to her and sees that she's still breathing, which was a disappointment because she wanted her to die from taking all these sleeping pills, but it doesn't matter. She takes out her hacksaw that she had borrowed from the neighbor earlier in the day and proceeds to butcher Valentina and she makes special care as she's cutting her into pieces to- What? Am I missing something? She was just literally your friend and now you- I'm so confused. Remove her lungs and not damage them because Tamara had a taste for human lungs. It was actually her favorite food. She took Valentina's head and she put it into a big pot of water and began boiling that to eat it. The rest of her was cut up into as small of pieces as she could get them and then wrapped in a shower curtain and placed in various bags. As Valentina's head and lungs are being cooked on the stovetop, Tamara begins making dozens of trips from the apartment down the stairs, out the front door, all the way down to the lake that was near their property where she would dispose of the body parts before coming back and getting more. Wait, I'm struggling to think, where's the video going to be at this point? What are we going to see? Valentina's hips and legs were apparently too heavy to haul all the way down to the lake, so she took them to a nearby forest. Tamara's final trip sees her carrying a big silver pot, inside of which is Valentina's head, or at least whatever is left of it after Tamara was done eating most of it. Oh my Four god. Four days later, on July 27th, a young couple that was living in the same apartment complex as Tamara and Valentina were out for a walk with their dog out near that lake. And as they're walking, their dog takes off running and stops in front of this huge bag that it's sniffing and pawing and trying to open. And the owners of the dog try to call it back, but they can't get it to get away from this bag. And so the owners walk over and they kind of poke the bag. They can see it's pretty heavy and they open it up and they find a human torso and it's Valentina's. When the police show up, the first thing they do is they go to Valentina's apartment and they're surprised to find Tamara living there. And they're kind
kind of sensitive with her and they say, your friend, your relative uh, was just found deceased and we need to look around the apartment. Tamara was completely indifferent. She did not care. They had just discovered her body and she didn't care that they were searching the apartment. It was like she knew someday this was gonna happen. During the search, the police officers quickly find blood all over the bathroom and in the kitchen. They even find the hacksaw she used that's got blood on it. And they find Tamara's diary that's sitting next to this book about black magic. And the police are horrified when they see that the diary contains meticulous notes that Tamara had kept of all of the ritualistic killings she had perpetrated over the past 20 years. Okay, so yeah, he obviously mentioned she had a taste for human lungs. So it goes to show she did this before but mate so they just found a serial killer here just sort of so she wasn't just suddenly attached to the house she was just crazy from the start and this triggered it from her and there was 14 of them and almost all of them were motivated by tamara's desire to cast spells that she apparently was reading about in these black magic books she had and virtually all of these spells required human flesh or other human components and so she would kill these people she would use their bodies to cast these spells and then afterwards she would consume them not because that had anything to do with the spell but because she liked the way people tasted, in particular, human lungs. The police arrest Tamara, who doesn't put up a fight. She says, yep, you got the right person. I did all this. While Tamara was on trial, she seemed like she was in a great mood. She told the judge, I hope you give me a really severe punishment. I expect to die in prison. She was seen blowing kisses to reporters. It was like she was just totally out of touch. Or maybe she literally knew this was going to happen and just didn't care anymore. Tamara, who would be nicknamed the Granny Ripper by newspapers over the course of this trial, was given a life sentence, and to this day, she is still sitting in jail. Here is the surveillance footage of Tamara disposing of Valentina's body, as well as some shots of Tamara during her trial. Oh, wow. What the fuck? What the actual hell, man? What a witch, an absolute witch. I'm... God, you're evil. You don't belong. You don't. Oh, how does someone get so mental like this? How do we breathe the same thing as these things? Like, God damn. They shouldn't be allowed. I don't even care. They shouldn't be allowed. I don't. I don't care. <laughs> so that's gonna do it, guys. Let me know what you thought. All from her friend offering her to flip and stay with her whilst the house is being renovated. Oh, it's crazy. <sighs> I wonder if she would have done it anyway eventually, but maybe it was triggered because she was forced to move out. I don't know, but yeah. With the second story, what's the point in having security cameras if there's no alarm that goes off when someone smashed windows and is walking? Yeah, that's true, to be fair. But it's easier to look in hindsight. And who's here? Who here didn't come from TikTok? Um, but yeah hopefully you enjoyed this reaction I say enjoyed hopefully you found this interesting if you want more reactions to the disturbing backstories or disturbing pictures I'll be sure to do so and that's pretty much it but until next time like subscribe peace